All right, welcome back to General Housing and Military Affairs. And we are here right now on JRH2. And this is a bill that we worked on quite a bit last year. It's a resolution and Michael will uh, explain the differences between the two um, and that balance between saying, no, this is not celebrating our high school basketball team um, as we do with a lot of resolutions. So this is a little bit different. This is being treated as a bill, but it's a resolution. So um, Michael will give us the details for that. So for committee that wasn't on the committee last year, we worked on this quite a bit in um, at this time last year, actually. Um, and it was brought forward uh, by uh, some of the same sponsors that are bringing this forward. And, and it was a, it was, we're going to have a, we're going to have an interesting time with this. This is a very difficult situ um, subject matter. And we were forced to put it aside with COVID. It was just, it just proved to be um, inappropriate to deal with this issue in the middle of a pandemic um, due, due to the, the subject matter that you'll hear about and the emotions that are behind it. So it is something that we, um, nearly got to the finish line, but did not get there. And this will also be done uh, in our committee this year in, in um, conjunction with H96, which was, which is a proposal to do a truth and reconciliation commission, which in our committee last year was a committee, was in the process of being a committee bill, which a committee bill is something that we decide that we wanna do that wasn't introduced by anybody else. And there are separate rules that, that exists with that. But then once the biennium passed, it's now a bill. So with that, I wanna turn the microphone over to John and let him, um, let him tell us the story of this bill from his perspective and why he chose to sponsor it this year. John, thank you. Well, great, thank you. And um, I don't know how many of us have, have read the book that we all got, but I did read it this weekend and it's, um, it's pretty startling. Um, when we look at what happened, and Henry Perkins was a UVM zo zoology professor, and he came up with the eugenics survey, and, what, and this was in 1925, and the survey worked with the social service agencies and the state, and they shared confidential information to profile families. They were often families that were living in the poor farms or the poor houses, um, it resulted in children being taken away, removed, incarcerated. And uh, you'll see in the bill language that um, some people could be returned if they agreed to be sterilized. And so the 1931, we uh, passed a bill and it was called an act for human betterment by voluntary sterilization. And henceforth, it shall be the policy of the state to prevent procreation of idiots, imbeciles, feeble-minded, or insane persons when the public welfare and the welfare of the idiots, feeble-minded, or insane persons likely to procreate can be improved by voluntary sterilization as Heron provided. So that's that's a statute um, that Mr. Perkins uh, in the book here was talking about that they wanted to preserve what he called old pioneer stock. Um, and they wanted to target families and they had were delinquents, were dependent on the state or had mental deficiencies. And so what we see from this is that it really over time targeted um, our Abenaki bands, people who are mixed race, French Canadians, the poor and people with disabilities. So there is uh, on page 172 in, in, in our book here that it profiles one family in Pondville and the neighbors complained, the truant officer complained to the state and there were seven kids and they said that they were pretty truant so they came in in the state, um, came into the household 
um, and the oldest woman, um, Helena, she, she was 17. She was taking care of the kids because her mother couldn't. And uh, she was sent to the Vermont Industrial School and the Brandon School for the Feeble-Minded, as were all the siblings. Three of the four oldest children, including Helena, were subsequently sterilized prior to discharge. And the three youngest of Brandon, high-grade high morons, were soon to graduate with high marks and excellent characters. Um, the family, Helena, after she was sterilized, was released and she did marry. And uh, three of the other kids got farm assistance and they, they did very productive. Um, the parents were destroyed when all the kids were taken away, of course. Um, so let me see. Here's, here's the quote. Had the community and authorities offered a helping hand, the report concluded, instead of eight years of incarceration, seven years of parole, and dozens of evaluations by doctors, social workers, and public officials, the state may have saved money and spared the family suffering. So I, why we're looking at this now is in 2019, UVM actually apologized because this research was based at UVM. Uh, Mr. Perkins was a, and it, as was his father, were, were scholars there. And uh, UVM apologized for its unethical and regrettable eugenics role. And they also took Mr. Perkins's name off the building. Um, and so it seemed right. And I'm bringing this forward for Mark Andy. We did this last year, but this has been uh, a topic uh, in the house for a long time about to do this. Uh, Representative Donahue told me she's been working on this issue for 10 years. Um, so um, I think that that's sort of the introduction. And Michael, if you could, I, first, it's a pleasure to work with you on this again. If you can walk us through it, I guess. And then thank we'll- you, Thank you very much. Can all of you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Very good. Uh, my name is Michael Chernick. I'm from the staff of Legislative Council. And I first worked on a version of this resolution as Representative Kalaki was indicating for Representative Donahue now over a decade ago. Uh, the resolution, which I believe most of you should have uh, either digitally or in hard copy, has a number of sponsors and its first clause at the bottom of page one in the hard copy version begins as follows. And it goes over much of the history that Representative Kalaki was and the points was just uh, mentioning. Whereas in 1925, University of Vermont zoology professor Henry F. Perkins established the discredited Eugenic Survey of Vermont to measure evidence of alleged delinquency, dependency, and mental defectiveness. And this survey targeted members of the Abenaki bands Vermonters of mixed racial or French Canadian heritage, the poor and persons with disabilities. And whereas the General Assembly adopted 1931 Acts and Resolves, number 174, Act 174, an act for human betterment by voluntary sterilization for the purpose of eliminating from the future Vermont genetic pool persons deemed mentally unfit to procreate. And whereas Act 174 resulted in the sterilization of Vermonters, and whether these individuals provided informed consent can be questioned. And whereas this state sanctioned eugenics policy was not an isolated example of oppression, but reflected the historic marginalization, discriminatory treatment, and displacement of these targeted groups in Vermont. And whereas eugenics advocates promoted sterilization for the protection of Vermont's old stock and to preserve the physical and social environment of Vermont for their children. And whereas the eugenics survey advocated for assistance from state and municipal officials and the resulting sterilization intruded on the lives of its victims and had devastating and irreversible impacts on the directly affected individuals and their families. And whereas in conducting the eugenics survey, the surveyors were granted access to case files from state agencies and institutions, and the files were made available to police departments, social workers, educators, and town officials. And whereas as a result of the opening of these files, children were removed from families, individuals were institutionalized or incarcerated, 
family connections were severed, and the sense of kinship and community was lost. And whereas on June 21, 2019, the University of Vermont issued a formal statement of sincere apology for its unethical and regrettable eugenics role, and the General Assembly, on behalf of the state of Vermont, should issue a similar apology. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate House of Representatives that the General Assembly sincerely apologizes and expresses its sorrow and regret to all individual Vermonters and their families and descendants who have were harmed as a result of state-sanctioned eugenics policies and practices, and be it further resolved that the General Assembly recognizes that further legislative action should be taken to address the continuing impact of state-sanctioned eugenics policies and related practices of disenfranchisement and ethnocide leading to genocide. Uh, just one final point, if I may, uh, Representative Stevens was indicating from a procedural perspective, the resolution is stating an expression of opinion of the legislature. It doesn't have a binding sense of law as a resolution cannot, with very limited uh, exception, perform that function. But that said, this, this resolution, um, if passed um, by the House and Senate, uh, would appear in what we call our white books on the record. Is that correct? Right. It would be part of the action. It would be part of the permanent action resolves and would appear in the set as part of the session laws, as you're referring to them as the white books. Right. Um, all right, John, do you want to have a, do you have a uh, final comment at all? Well, for those that weren't with us, we've heard, we heard a lot of testimony, um, you know, and by this point it was stories of their grandparents that, that people were sharing that when I, people, they wouldn't answer the door because they were afraid if they opened the door, the kids would be taken away and some of their um, descendants were taken away. So it's, it has left a really, a scarring legacy for people as we heard. Yeah, it's, um, there's, a, there's a lot to say about it. And again, this is an introduction. And so we'll feel free to ask questions without any kind of, any kind of commentary that we might have about the bill today will be fairly broad um, because of the, you know, what we will treat this as a bill. Again, it's, it's not uncommon for resolutions to go to committees. It's not, it's not um, frequent uh, because it's rarely, um, resolutions are rarely asked to be written that have this kind of um, depth to them. Um, but we can, again, we can open up the floor for some questions to Michael um, and to and to us all, and especially those of us who were here last year who worked on this. Um, Representative Hango. Thank you. Last year, this was JRH 7, and I was looking back in my notes, and I, I would like to know if there's anything different, because I remember, and I see, I see a date of the beginning of March, um, which I think was just prior to the town meeting. Um, no, actually it was when we came back from town meeting. So the last week we were actually in person in the legislature um, that we were discussing the final paragraph, the final clause, um, the final resolved clause, excuse me. Um, and I don't remember whether that actually was in JRH 7 or we were just talking about it and the author has put it into JRH 2. You. Well, I, I, Michael and I worked on this resolution um, over the summer or not summer, <laughs> the, the fall. And we looked at what, what we did last time and then Michael went back to make sure it was all to, according to statutes and things. And this, is the conversation our committee was having. And this was one version. And we there, there were two different versions, but we put this version in this, this one. Thank you. But, yeah. 
Representative right? Hango, just to reaffirm what Representative Kalaki just said, you would be correct to state that loss resolve clause was not in the introduced JRH 7, but this was one of the two potential, if you remember, I had a version with two final clauses. This was one of the two potential clauses where the committee was uh, when the committee left at the beginning of the pandemic. That's correct. Thank you so much for confirming that. Yeah, so um, again, this is a uh, difficult piece of our history. Um, it's something that we're going to, um, I guess, and discuss and determine if this is the right language that we want to put across. Um, our research last year in, um, in this and it, like the concept of an apology. I think Michael, we determined last year also through testimony anyway and research that the state has never apologized for actions it's taken quite like this before. Is that accurate to your knowledge? To the best of my knowledge, the only official apology with respect to the eugenics movement was the apology issued by the University of Vermont a couple of years ago. All right. And in areas where um, there have been apologies now, the um, uh, Canadian government has apologized twice for treatment of First Nations individuals. Um, two different times because the first one was viewed as not sufficient. And the second one was primarily about the taking of children from, from their homes to, to um, send them to, to schools that would de-Indian them or whatever, you know, however you want to phrase it. Um, and one of the things that we learned that we talked about last year was that there's, to make an apology like this, especially to this population, um, isn't enough which is why H96 has been um, put forward, which is a, which is a bill to, um, that proposes to form a committee that would determine what a Truth and Reconciliation Commission would look like. And um, that's something that I feel like, like needs an incredible amount of inclusivity in determining what that means in research. Um, there's not a lot of Truth and Reconciliation Commissions out in the world, but there are um, a small number of them. Before we move forward with other things that have been discussed in the Social Equity Caucus, such as um, reparations. Um, so so that's, that would be a proposal to do the thing that one does after one apologizes to make sure that what we're apologizing for is, is sincere. Um, Representative Triano. Yes, thank you. Uh, Michael, I'm curious, was, did in your, any of your research, or John, um, do we know if there was an opposition to this movement uh, when it reached the House of Representatives here? Well, y yes, there was. Uh, Mr. Perkins did try to get legislation in 1925 passed, and the Senate passed it, and the House rejected it. But the bill came back in 1931. So on the House side, it was rejected. If I may, Mr. Chair, there were efforts in 27 that did not uh, come to fruition. Yep. Yeah, and that's in the history. Um, and that's why I recommended to, if the homework for people to read the, the Breeding Better Vermonters book and to look at JRH7 from last biennium um, look at some of the witnesses that testified and provided hard copies or electronic copies of material. We will hear from them or invite them back. Um, there is an essay that was done for the Vermont Historical Society um, by a woman named Mercedes de Guardiola, um, which provides a slightly different view on the history. Um, it's a different facet, it's a more political facet of the history rather than what uh, Breeding Better Vermonters really concentrates on on the um, academic side and uh, quite a bit. Um, 
And then there's a whole section in the book cast. I haven't read it all, but I read chapter eight, which talks about the role of eugenics and the differential between um, what it meant in the twenties and thirties to be talking about it and um, who took it as science, who took it as junk science you know, how it had been regarded even back then. But the thing that's in Mercedes de Guardiola's essay that's in our record is that this conversation actually started in Vermont as early as 1912, um, according to her records. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting conversation. Um, it, we'll probably hear testimony that says, well, that's just what they were thinking back then, or, you know, they were just trusting the science. I mean, which are, those are phrases that we hear today. Uh, so it's going to be, you know, a real, a real workout um, to just really look at the kind of work that we do and how we do it and how we make decisions and how they made decisions in 1931 to finally pass this bill, um, which started up um, a couple of different generations of real terror for some people. Representative Hango. Thank you. Um, when we do hear from witnesses, my notes indicate that we were going to try to look harder to find um, testimony from French Canadians, whether it be in person or written, and we had a hard time finding that. So um, putting everybody on notice now that if you know French Canadians who are affected, who have been affected by this, that we would love to hear from them. Um, because we certainly heard from a number of Abnaki um, and we've heard from uh, the disabled population. We've heard from people who are mental health advocates. So it would be good to hear from another segment of the population that was affected. And, you know, just in terms of the interesting things that uh, are brought up by looking at this uh, one year later, and there are so many things that have changed for us in terms of the virus um, and hearing about science. And even, you know, back in the, in the 20s and 30s, birth control and sterilization were, were things that the general public did not embrace that. If, if anything, people wanted to have more and more children um, to work on the farms and, and whatnot. And birth control was really quite a no-no for many, many decades. Um, and the fact that this prominent scientist was advocating for birth control for certain aspect or certain populations is quite interesting. And it, it's almost a little um, disturbing to me that to look at this one year later and be able to read different things into this book than maybe what I had read into it a year ago. So I, I definitely encourage people to look at it through the lens of what we're, we're going through now. And, um, you know, just thinking about how attitudes can change over time, sometimes in a very short time. Okay. Thank you. Um, Representative Murphy, you had your hand up. I did. Thank you, but I don't need to speak. Okay. Um, All right. I, um, does anybody have any preliminary questions on this? Again, uh, to, to the question about the um, French Canadians representative, we have been um, trying to track down representatives from the French Canadian society. Um, Ron did some research and put a call out through the historical society. I've talked to um, one woman who I believe is the the passes, I mean, it's a volunteer organization and they do primarily genealogical work. Um, however, one of the witnesses that we did have last year, Judy Dow, um, did a presentation on eugenics to their organization over 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago now. And I think that um, some of that was shared. Some of that testimony was shared with us by Judy last year. And um, so th this person is seeking out um, has put a call out to her organization to see if anyone is willing to testify to this. Um, 
because that was clearly, you know, it was kind of kind of like, oh, we need to, we do need to address this if we can find folks from from this affected community. And and we also took testimony from from folks in the in the our our indigenous population that yes, there was some cross marriage between the Abenaki and the French Canadians because of course the Abenaki from the Missisquoi area went to Quebec in the 1600s um, and became uh, associated with the Odenac and um, before they came back due, due to, um, well, due, what happened, you know, with the, with the Abenaki, with the indigenous population was, you know, was they lost 90% of their population. Um, so, very difficult, very difficult um, to find folks who aren't intermarried, but we are seeking with the French Canadian society to get, to find people who might testify to their experience if they have, if they choose to talk about it. And that's really what we found. The sensitivity we found with the, both the indigenous and the disabled community was, was there was a real sensitivity and fear still that they might be targeted. Um, for some kind of retribution for who they are. So that's not the palate cleanser I was hoping to get to first after H81, but um, but it is a priority, it was a priority for this committee last year. And we're gonna see if we can um, fulfill that priority this year. Um, Michael, one last piece of clarity um, from you. Uh, resolutions of this kind are not subject to crossover. Is that, that is correct? correct? The rules on crossover are not applicable to resolutions, be they the concurrence, the typical ones that all of you think of the congratulating the sports team or the more serious policy resolutions. So crossover is not a, a factor. The one thing that would be a factor, of course, is depending on if and when the committee were to vote the resolution out, how much time is left for the Senate to deal with it this year. And of course it remains alive for both years of the biennium. Should one house right. pass it and the other not. And to be honest in my conversations with leadership, I think that the, you know, I, I feel comfortable starting work on this bill in this Zoom um, atmosphere. Um, however, if we do get to the point where we are able to um, pass this. Now, Michael, if I'm not, again, correct me if I'm mistaken on process here. Um, when this is presented on the floor, we are not, we're, we're, the House would be voting on a resolution that contains an apology within it. Correct. But it's not complete until the Senate has also passed it um, through their body, and then the pro tem and the and the speaker sign it, and it becomes official. And it's at that, that is point. Correct, unless that is correct, unless you opted, which I know this is not what you've chosen to do, unless the committee were to opt to do a house only resolution, just right. expressing. And of course, those if you were to do a house only resolution, it would not appear in the acts and resolves in the white books only in the journals and on the website. Right, and so that, and, and the um, executive branch is not a party to this resolution because of course this is the legislature in this case making an apology through this resolution. So the that is correct. We, uh, our office, the legislative council stopped sending resolutions to the governor to be signed about 40 years ago after right. an unrelated incident. So the governor does, has no involvement since this is not binding law. As I said, this is merely the expression of a, an opinion on the part of the General Assembly. Right. And so just to keep that in mind, that's, um, I mean, I, I, I think that that's, as we approach crossover, just as we did last year, um, it, there are still negotiations that would have to happen between the speaker and the and the Senate pro tem, obviously, to pick it up if if the Senate found it a priority as well. That's that's their prerogative. But um, I just it, this is this is um, as in most bills, this is our half of the of the story. 
Um, so, and the, the idea here is that if we were to pass this through the House and the Senate, that it would be, what would be inappropriate, at least in some respects, would be speaking a speech of apology over Zoom to an affected pop to the affected populations. You know, it just this is what we miss from not being in person. Um, and so, I mean, but given the way that we work, and given the fact that we'll still be at this in May, it's you know, I, again, I would I would hope that we if this passes that we would be able to um, a, a do an apology um, that coincided with some ability to meet at least in a socially distant way um, in person. Um, it seems a little one dimensional to me to, to try to do it through a computer screen. Um, but that's, that's for consideration. That's a leadership consideration. And that's something that we don't have to worry about in our immediate work here. So, all right. Um, I am going to call it a day. Um, I appreciate everybody um, hearing this and hearing the um, material that we heard all day. This today was a, I don't know, I had one of those general housing and military affairs days with all the different subjects that we handled today. So um, let's take off a little bit early and um, We'll see you tomorrow morning. Ron, we're at nine tomorrow or 9.15? We are at nine tomorrow. And um, continue with budget presentations. We'll start at nine o'clock with the military department, followed by liquor and lottery, followed by housing and development. And so I think at that time too, um, we should have time to um, finish up our conversation again. The decision, the need to write a, a, a full-on memo to the joint committee, um, joint fiscal committee, has been relaxed. But uh, and Josh, will Commissioner Hanford will be here on Friday to go through their take on it. But I think um, we can just touch base with him. But please feel free to read the other material that we shared today, especially from um, Wendy Morgan. And I think that there's a proposal from the Landlords Association as well, just to read through it and see what they're planning and know that that, that those programs would be handled through the, um, that $18 million or, or 20%, the 10% um, for services and for administration and that the administration's proposal includes all of those organizations so far in their recommendations. So. Um, with that, have a good night.